delayed today, but for good reason. Uh, so I have a couple of items at the top. Uh, as you know, tonight the President uh, will deliver his first primetime address to the American people at 8 p.m. Today marks the one-year anniversary of the shutdown due to COVID-19, and the President will speak directly to the American people about the sacrifices made from the more than 500,000 lives lost to the millions of people who are lost, have lost their jobs and the even millions more who have been impacted by the pandemic. He will provide an update on the work of his team to address the greatest operational challenge the country has faced and the work his team has done to rapidly increase the number of vaccinations, vaccines, vaccination, vaccinators, and vaccination sites. And he will lay out the next steps he will take to get the pandemic under control. Even while he is focused on getting the American Rescue Plan across the finish line, he has been reviewing drafts of the speech. Uh, last week he was, and of course through the course of this week, and making line edits. Uh, he's been uh, uh, providing line edits in, in order to ensure that he is striking the right tone and providing the right level of clarity uh, as he prepares to address the country this evening. He plans to provide a clear outline of his approach, level with the American people about what is required of them, but also provide a sense of hope of what is possible. I wanted to provide a little bit more on upcoming travel. Uh, as you of, of, of all of our principles as we as we work to, as we prepare to go out and engage with the American people of, about what is in the rescue plan. Uh, as you know, uh, next week the President, the Vice President, the First Lady and the Second Gentleman will be traveling across the country to kick off the Help Is Here Tour and amplify the American Rescue Plan. On Monday, the First Lady will travel to Burlington, New Jersey. The Vice President and Second Gentleman will travel to Las Vegas, Nevada. On Tuesday, the President will travel to Delaware County, Pennsylvania, as you already are aware. The Vice President and second, second Gentleman will travel to Denver, Colorado. On Wednesday, the Second Gentleman will travel to, travel to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And on Friday, the President and the Vice President will travel to Atlanta, Georgia. During their trips, they will discuss the benefits of the American Rescue Plan for working families, and they will engage with people at each of these stops about uh, how uh, the American people can benefit from the components of the package uh, moving forward. So they will talk about the $1,400 checks that more than that 158.5 million American households can expect, uh, and which uh, and many who will start receiving them soon. He will talk about the historic expansion of the child tax credit. He will talk about extending, they will all talk about extending unemployment insurance for around 11 million Americans, the tens of billions of dollars in rental and homeowners assistance that is a part of this package, the expansion of the earned income tax credit, which will go to 17 million workers, and the components of the package that significantly reduce health insurance premiums for millions of American families, and of course the fact that the bill will lift 11 million people out of poverty and cut child poverty in half. Uh, they're eager to get out there on the road. And I have one more uh, exciting implementation update for all of you. Since the Treasury Department, Department of Treasury and the IRS are working hard to get relief payments out the door as fast as possible to the American people, uh, people can expect to uh, start seeing direct deposits uh, hit their bank accounts as early as this weekend. This is, of course, just the first wave, uh, but uh, some people will start, some people in the country will start seeing those uh, in those direct deposits in their bank accounts this weekend, and payments to eligible Americans will continue throughout the course of the next several weeks. So with that, Jonathan, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Jen. Uh, tomorrow, you, the Chief of Staff tweeted uh, that there'll still be a celebration in terms of this bill signing and congressional leaders would be uh, attending. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us who will be there and if any Republicans, who none of whom voted for this uh, bill, would be invited? So the uh, the celebration tomorrow uh, will be a bipartisan, I mean a bicameral, excuse me, uh, event, um, but it will not be bipartisan. It will be it will include leadership, uh, and we are still finalizing the list of attendees. But we hope to get that to you as soon as it's finalized. Can you walk us through uh, as part of the Help Us Here tour uh, decisions behind the locations for the travel uh, next week, in particular the president's two stops? Why why the, why Pennsylvania and why Georgia? 
Well, this is just the beginning of, of the president and the first la and the first ladies and the vice presidents and the second gentleman's uh, travel, and they will of course do some travel in addition to next week. But it was important to the president to visit not just blue states, uh, and, and but also red states, purple states. You will see that reflected as we continue to announce uh, travel and trips that he will take in the coming weeks. Uh, obviously, these are um, two places where uh, he, he of course talked about the importance of of delivering on the promise of getting every American the $2,000 checks when he campaigned in Georgia in December. So that's a place where that uh, message really resonated, of course, with the people of the state uh, and where it was amplified to the public. Uh, but, you know, it's a place also close to his heart. But this is just the beginning of the travel. I wouldn't over read into it other than uh, he, he is looking to uh, having, he's looking forward to having uh, the senior members, uh, the the principals from the administration out across the country, fanning out across the country, which is exactly what they're doing. And then one more on a uh, on a different topic. The trial of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has begun uh, in reaction to the death of George Floyd. Has the president been briefed on the development so far and he condemned uh, the death certainly when it happened? Does he believe the police officer should be convicted of murder? Well, the, the president obviously doesn't weigh into um, uh, he's not going to weigh into an ongoing uh, judicial uh, or a legal case. Um, he's watching it closely, um, as are many members of the administration. Uh, as you know, he himself encouraged the House to pass the bill uh, that, um, uh, and he is uh, very pleased that it did. Uh, and policing reform, in, in broadly speaking, is an issue uh, that he believes is urgent and one that he is committed to working with leaders in Congress and also taking steps as he can take on his own uh, to address. Uh, but you know, he has spoken about uh, he spoke about the trial and, of course, the the death of George George Floyd in personal terms, and that is a reflection of how he continues to feel as he watches. Uh, the events unfold with the trial. It affected him personally. Um, it redoubled his commitment to address advancing racial justice. Um, that's why he signed an executive order on racial equity on his sixth day, one of the reasons why he signed a, uh, a, an executive order on racial equity on his sixth day in office. And of course, he will be watching it closely, as many people in the country will be. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Jen, a follow-up on some of the vaccine news from yesterday. Mm -hmm. The president said, that one reason he wanted to have another 100 million uh, doses of the Johnson Johnson vaccine in the cupboards, as it were, is to be prepared. Um, if everyone is vaccinated by the end of May, or at least able to be, what are you preparing for? What might happen that the U.S. would need an additional 100 million shots for? Well, uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but the reason why uh, he, one of the reasons why we ordered uh, the additional 100 million doses is because we don't yet know uh, what uh, vaccine is most effective with children. Those test that testing is still happening with the FDA as we speak. Uh, as you noted, he wants to be over prepared and over supplied. We're still looking at the impact of variants. Uh, these this order of uh, dosage can doses can also be used for uh, booster shots, which is something that's also under uh, review by the FDA. So. He's just preparing to ensure we are ready for every contingency uh, here in the United States. Uh, of course, we want to be a part of the um, effort around the world to vaccinate uh, people around the world in a range of countries. Um, that's why we've provided $2 billion to COVAX with another $2 billion committed. We are the largest funder of global health in the world, um, and we've invested over $150 billion in global health activity since 2000. We re-engaged on day one with the World Health Organization, and we're continuing to engage. He is personally, and many levels of our administration are engaged personally with their counterparts about addressing this pandemic globally. But his first priority and focus is on ensuring that the American people are vaccinated. And uh, once we are at that point, uh, we will have a discussion about what's next. I, my understanding is the, the president directed this to happen yesterday, but the deal is not with J&J &J isn't yet in place. When do you expect the deal to be made? As soon I can get you an update, I can check with our team and see if there's uh, what the final details are. But we certainly anticipate and expect the deal to fully move forward. Just one other vaccine question related to a story that my colleagues did from Europe. Uh, has the U.S. told the European Union not to expect deliveries of COVID-19 vaccines from AstraZeneca that are made in this country? Well, I would say first we have conveyed 
privately what we've conveyed publicly, which is that our focus is on ensuring the American people are vaccinated. And of course, any company can work with uh, any country around the world uh, on uh, the purchase of vaccine supply. And certainly that wouldn't be something the U.S. government would be directly engaged with. But in terms of the supply we have purchased, our first focus, our primary focus is on vaccinating the American people. That's what we've conveyed publicly and privately as well. Yeah, you said that a lot. Has, but have there been any specific indications or conversations with the EU saying, don't expect this to come from our country, at least until the rest of this, vac of this population is vaccinated? I, we, we have pretty, we have said that, we have said publicly exactly what I've conveyed, which is what I'm conveying is we convey the same thing privately. Of course, any country can purchase vaccines from uh, these manufacturers uh, directly. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, says the people coming into the U.S. right now see Biden, President Biden, as the migrant president. Does the White House take that as a compliment? The migrant, give me a little more context. Well, he said uh, they see him as the migrant president, and so many feel but so many feel they're going to reach the United States. We need to work together to regulate the flow because this business can't be tackled from one day to the next. Well, first, it's Mexico will have to be, is an important partner in ensuring we're addressing uh, the flow of migrants from uh, Central America uh, through Mexico uh, and many to the border of the United States. Uh, we have conveyed uh, privately and publicly as well that the majority of people who come to our border will be turned away. Uh, we certainly also recognize that because the president and our administration has made a decision that the way to humanely approach immigration is to allow for, um, you know, uh, for unaccompanied minors to come and be treated with humanity and, and be, uh, be uh, in, in, in safe uh, place uh, while we're considering, uh, while we're trying to get them into new home, into homes and sponsored homes, that uh, that some more may have come to our border. And there have been, of course, a, a, a large flow of children across the border. We recognize that, but we, that is that we made a policy decision because we felt it was the humane approach. But the facts are the vast, vast majority of people who come to our border are turned away. And the statistics bear that out. Okay. And then in terms of keeping COVID out of the country, does the White House think that it's a problem that Travelers have to show a negative COVID test, proof of a negative COVID test when they fly into the U.S. from any foreign country. But travelers don't need to show anything like that when they just walk across the border as long as they don't go to a port of entry. Well, I think there's been a lot of confusion about what's been happening at the border um, as it relates to um, people who are coming across um, and what happens uh, when they come across. And I know Governor Abbott down in Texas has uh, has uh, expressed some of his concerns, and many of those have not been based in fact. So let me go through a few of those because I know we're all interested in facts around here. Uh, one. Uh, Governor Abbott has referred to what's happening at the border as open borders, as us having an open borders policy. That is absolutely incorrect. Uh, the border is not open. The vast majority of individuals uh, apprehended or encountered at the border continue to be denied entry and are returned under, under Title 42, as we've already mentioned. Uh, also, he has suggested that uh, we are not vaccinating CBP officers. Uh, again, we like to deal with facts around here. There's no higher priority than the health and safety of our federal workforce. And the Department of Homeland Security and CBP has been clear that uh, currently more than 64,000 frontline DHS employees, including members of U.S. Border Patrol, have received a vaccination. Uh, so that's another just point just to provide full clarity. Uh, the other piece is, is the question about um, the testing of migrants uh, at the border uh, or testing of migrants as, as they are coming across. And we have DHS and FEMA have stepped in and worked with local mayors, NGOs, and public health officials in Texas to implement a system to provide COVID-19 testing and, as needed, isolation and quarantine for families released from border patrol facilities. Their proposal and agreement would cover 100% of the expense of the testing, isolation, and quarantine. But Governor Abbott has decided to reject that. So there are a number, there's a lot of confusion about these issues, and I just wanted to provide a little point of clarity here. But not asking about Governor Abbott, asking about President Biden in charge of the federal government. Why are the feds relying on NGOs to administer these tests? We've talked to people down at the border who say, 
that migrants are only tested if they show symptoms, that seems like a loophole. That's not an accurate depiction. Uh, there is, uh, there's an important role that NGOs, that local mayors, that local officials play in, uh, in in working together. And this is a proposal that was worked with DHS, with um, FEMA, and others to help address and ensure that people are tested. Uh, and Governor Abbott, I, I raised that simply because he had raised a concern about that. And I wanted to be clear that we've put forward a proposal. So I think the question is, why is he standing in the way of local communities getting the funding and support they need to help with testing, isolation, and quarantining efforts? But again, just a question about Biden administration policy. Mm -hmm. COVID is COVID. COVID at the Dulles Airport Customs is the same as COVID in a border town. Uh, so I'm curious why it is that it's enforced for people flying in from other countries, but it is not a requirement by the federal government to test or to prove a negative test anywhere along the border except at a port of entry. Well, again, I can just describe to you what our policies are. If there's more to convey to you, I am happy to do that. And then just one quick one on uh, green jobs. You guys have talked a lot about tackling the, cr the climate crisis while creating good paying jobs. Now the president of the Texas AFL-CIO has come out to say someone working in a refinery leaving to go install solar panels, they're probably going to take a 75% cut in pay. Is that something the administration is aware of? I'm not sure which jobs are being compared there. Here, here's what I can convey to you. Uh, the president is committed during his presidency to uh, invest in, uh, work with labor unions, with climate activists, with a range of, with the industry, to invest in good paying, clean energy jobs. And he believes that unions uh, have an incredibly important role to play in ensuring that those are um, high paying jobs, that those treat the people who are in them with the respect and value that they deserve through collective bargaining rights and a range of the benefits of uh, union organizing, uh, being a part of a union. Obviously, that requires um, additional work and investment by the federal government working with Congress to invest in what we see as industries of the future. Oil and gas jobs are uh, not going away. Uh, there are uh, many industries that are, of course, continuing to uh, function. The outgoing administration flooded the oil markets with cheap federal leases. This will not affect oil and gas production or jobs for years to come. But what our objective is, is to invest in what we see as the industries of the future, where we feel is where the jobs are going to be moving forward. And the president looks forward to continuing, to delivering on his commitment to doing exactly that. High paying, good paying, but equal paying? Uh, high paying, good paying jobs. I, I, I think we're equal comparing a, a little bit of, I'm, I'm not sure what specific jobs you're comparing. What I'm conveying is the, the commitment to ensuring that jobs in the uh, clean energy industry will be high paying, union jobs, that's what the president's objective and commitment is too. Uh, go ahead, Caitlin. The White House has said that President Biden wants to look ahead to a return to normal in his speech tonight, but how does he do that while also striking the balance that 1,500 Americans on average are still dying from coronavirus every single day? You're absolutely right, Caitlin, that his objective is to strike exactly that balance. And this is one of the reasons that he has been line, I, line editing this speech for the last uh, week plus uh, to ensure that he is conveying, that he is leveling with the American people, that he is delivering on his commitment to being truthful about the challenges that we continue to face, what is going to be required of the American public to get to a return to normalcy as you conveyed. But he also wants to provide a sense of hope and what's possible if we abide by the guidelines, if when you have access to a vaccine, you get the vaccine, uh, what people can look forward to. And so he is, th that is exactly the balance that he is hoping to strike tonight. So should we expect like concrete steps and policy changes in this speech tonight? I think you can expect, uh, you know, this is his first opportunity, prime time, of course, uh, to really speak directly to the public. You, We all have a conversation about a lot of these issues every single day. Uh, most millions of Americans out there uh, are uh, living their lives, some of them, uh, you know, dealing with uh, their, their kids in school, getting their jobs done, et cetera. And this will be an opportunity for many people to really tune in and hear from him on 
his plan on what his team has done to date, uh, what steps they've taken, an update since he took office, but also concrete steps he wants to take moving forward. There will be some news in the speech, uh, but uh, it is really about laying out clearly uh, and, and uh, for the for the American public what steps he's taken, what his team will do, and what is expected of them as well. And since he's just signed this bill, has he decided who is going to oversee the implementation of it? And then on the ceremony tomorrow, you have some Republican senators who did not vote for this bill now touting parts of it. What is President Biden's response to those Republicans like Senator Wicker? Well, we invite them to work with us on the agenda moving forward, because clearly the bill that the president just signed into law is something that the American people are excited about, that uh, people will benefit from as soon as this weekend, as we conveyed. And uh, we are hopeful that as the president talks about his Build Back Better agenda, has more meetings with members of Congress, we'll have uh, more people on board from both sides of the aisle. And regarding who's overseeing? Oh, uh, you know, we are, as I mentioned yesterday, the president absolutely is committed to having a person who run, is running point on it. I don't have any personnel announcements so One today. question on the border. The administration has refused to call it a crisis instead of referring to it as a challenge and saying what you call it doesn't make a difference of how you're responding to it. But now today there are over 3,700 children, unaccompanied migrant children, in Border Patrol good custody. They're spending, on average, over 100 hours, four days, in these facilities that are jail-like facilities not meant for children. So how can you say that's not a crisis? Well, I think what uh, Ambassador Jacobson and Secretary uh, Mayorkas were conveying, and what I've conveyed, is it doesn't matter what you call it. It is an enormous challenge. It is something that is front and center for the president. Uh, as as we I noted yesterday, uh, he had what is a, a regular meeting, but he had a briefing yesterday on the trip to the border. And there are a number of, uh, while well, there are no final policy decisions, there are a variety of um, of actions under consideration, including identifying and ex uh, assessing other licensed facilities that can help add safe capacity for these children, relaunching, as we talked about over the last couple of days, the Central American Minors Program, accelerating the unification of children with vetted families, uh, family and sponsors, uh, steps like embedding HHS and OR are in the earlier parts of the process. So, you know, the president is very focused and very in the weeds on the operational details here and on, on taking and, and pushing his team to take every step uh, that can be taken to address exactly what you noted, Caitlin, which is the fact that children should not, these Border Patrol facilities are not made for children, uh, that we should, uh, we are focused on expediting the time they spend there, that these HHS shelters are not meant for uh, permanently, for permanent living, uh, for anyone permanently living there, that we want to expedite the timeline between when kids cross the border and when they are getting to sponsor homes. So our focus here is on uh, getting to the root of the issues uh, uh, and taking actions, and we don't feel the need to, uh, you know, play games with what it's called. But aren't those the steps that you would take if it was a crisis that you had on your hands? These are the policies we're taking to address what we feel is a vital uh, human uh, challenge at the border. But uh, what our responsibility here is to do is to project and convey what policies we're taking, uh, what the president's commitment is. That's exactly what we're doing, and uh, we don't see the need to put new labels. Go ahead. Jen, thank you. Um, no Republicans voted for the COVID relief package, and they argue that this is the sixth package and it adds to a deficit that's already a trillion dollars this year alone. What do you say to that criticism, that ultimately this type of a sweeping piece of legislation will be a drag on the economy down the line? Well, I would say to them, uh, we're in the midst of uh, twin crises, uh, from the pandemic to an economic downturn that are, is impacting tens of millions of people in this country. People are struggling to make ends meet. They are worried about whether their grandparents, their cousins, their friends are able to get a vaccine. And they are suffering uh, because they're worried about the mental health of their kids who aren't back in school yet. And uh, the president's focus is on addressing those crises. Uh, and I would point a question, send a question back to many of these uh, Republicans as to why uh, the deficit spending wasn't as concerning when they were giving tax cuts to the highest income, but now it's concerning when we're giving uh, direct checks and relief to the American people. When you look forward at the rest of the agenda that President Biden has laid out, how do you get even moderate Democrats on board with another big piece of legislation, for example, his climate? 
plan that has a price tag of two trillion dollars? There's no price tag on a plan that doesn't exist yet. Uh, so there. Are, well, sure, but he also laid out uh, many components of his Build Back Better agenda during his campaign, and we don't, we haven't made a final decision yet as to what uh, the format, the size, uh, what the next proposal will be. It's uh, not even something that has been brought to him for a decision quite yet. Obviously, he's had a lot of discussions and meetings to hear from Republicans and Democrats, but we're just not at that point in the process yet. But I know you're not going to weigh in on the specifics of what he's going to tackle next. But given that this was not a bipartisan piece of legislation, and given that the president said that unity was one of the key things he wanted to try to accomplish, is he going to try to move forward on a piece of legislation where he thinks he can get bipartisan support? In other words, how is that going to factor into his decision-making process? Well, the president would, of course, love to have bipartisan support, and there are areas of policymaking that he has talked about quite a bit, as you noted some of them on the campaign trail, including infrastructure. Uh, it, modernizing our immigration system has actually historically been a bipartisan policy making issue. Uh, he had a meeting on cancer and addressing cancer uh, and uh, tackling cancer, of course. Um, there are a lot of issues that he feels uh, there's opportunity to work together on and his open his door the door to the oval office remains open to bipartisanship to finding ways to certainly work together i could try one more time on the issue at the border um, and just follow up on the comments of the mexican president who said that the surge in unaccompanied migrants is because they see the president as the migrant president what does that say about how the president is handling this situation Look, I think the president has been clear, uh, as has every member of our administration. You had Ambassador Jacobson doing this the other day, uh, that the border is not open. Now is not the time to come. Uh, we uh, are, turn away the vast majority of people who come to the border, the vast, vast majority. These numbers are put out by CBP and the Department of Homeland Security, and people can see those numbers. Uh, we stand by our decision and our policy as an administration not to send unaccompanied minors back on the treacherous journey. So, you know, that is our policy because we feel it's humane and it's moral, and we think the world sees it that way as well. Does the message need to be even clearer, though? Yesterday, Ambassador Jacobson acknowledged that, yes, she said in her own words, you're trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. Does there need to be a more streamlined message? in order to prevent this surge. Well, she also talked about, Kristen, which is true, in the region, we're, we're, we're working against the efforts of smugglers and others who are conveying a different message. Uh, one of the steps we're taking uh, that I touched on a little bit earlier is also uh, thinking of, of, of uh, rebuilding or going back to some of the policies that were in place previously uh, where children could apply uh, for um, uh, the Central American uh, uh, Minors Program, which was ended in 2017. We estimate there's about 3,000 uh, kids who might be eligible, who could apply, and they could apply from the region, which would mean they wouldn't make the treacherous journey. They wouldn't be at the border working through Border Patrol. Uh, and so we're looking for ways to uh, reduce the number of kids who are taking this treacherous journey. And then we're also looking for ways to expedite uh, when kids are connected to family members, to um, you know, uh, safe sponsor homes. Uh, and we're looking for ways to expedite uh, getting them from the Border Patrol facilities uh, into the shelters as well. So th there's our, there's uh, uh, numbers, numbers challenges here, and we're working through a lot of the operations details and specifics, but um, we stand by, um, you know, the, what we feel is a more humane approach uh, to uh, what is happening at the border, and we are looking for ways operationally to make it more efficient, uh, to move kids through the system more quickly, uh, and ultimately when they get um, to the point where we're there with sponsor homes, the, many of them will not be able to stay, most of them. They have to apply and they have to go through the process, but we still are working for ways to expedite the system in the meantime. Uh, go ahead. Uh, one follow-up on uh, Jeff's question on the discussions with the EU sure. on the, um, well, I, I don't know if it's necessarily an export ban, but the EU is saying the U.S. Re uh, request was denied to export vaccines, but specifically on the AstraZeneca one, that's not yet authorized in the U.S., and the U.S. hasn't sought authorization. So why are you guys sitting on these doses that 
could be used in the EU now because it's already authorized there, but not here. Well, we don't, we're not sitting, I'm not sure which doses you're talking about that we're sitting on. There's a report out of, um, out of Europe that the U.S. told the European Union that they cannot expect any AstraZeneca shipments anytime soon. Well, we don't, we, we don't own so purchases, we didn't purchase AstraZeneca supplies. I mean, so the, there's no export prohibitions and all vaccine manufacturers in the United States are free to export their products while also fulfilling the terms of their contracts with the U.S. government. In, in any of these government contracts with the individual companies, are there specific export prohibitions if it's not an export ban overall in the, in the contracts that the U.S. government has with these companies? Well, our, but you're talking about whether we're going to give our supply to other countries, right? Or are you talking about whether these country or whether these manufacturers are going to sell um, sub d doses to other countries? Correct. The second? Uh, whether the, sorry, say that again. So I'm just trying to understand. So are you talking about whether these companies are allowed to sell doses of their, of their? Um... Well, I'm, I'm talking about how it's almost like a triangle, right? Because these, co these companies have contracts with the US government that say you have to fulfill this contract with us. Right. And so is any of that prohibiting then exports of any of the doses produced well, here as to I just the conveyed there's, there's no there's these are not export um, prohi prohibitions uh, vaccine manufacturers in the United States are free to export their products while also fulfilling the terms of our contracts there are there are supply that they are producing for the United States but uh, they can also work with other countries and sorry now I think I now okay. we're on the same level so okay the contracts that you have with these companies, are there any specific, um, is there a specific uh, provision in those contracts that would say you cannot export until you fulfill our contractual obligation with the U.S. government? I don't have any more details of the contracts, but obviously these companies can work with um, other countries on selling uh, uh, their products, manufacturers can work uh, with them to, uh, with these countries directly. We have conveyed privately what we've conveyed publicly, which is our focus is on ensuring the American people are receiving the vaccine uh, and that we are vaccinating the American public. That's our first priority, but we are also engaging with and working with the global community uh, to figure out how we can get the global pandemic under control together, whether that's through financial contributions or through, uh, you know, navigating with them how we can work together uh, to address it. But we'll continue to evaluate as more vaccines become available in the United States. AstraZeneca isn't even approved at this point. Yeah. Can I, one other topic completely different. Um, you just said again, the president hasn't yet made a decision on the next legislative package or what it will be and when yeah. it will be unveiled. Um, there's a, it seems to be a little bit of momentum uh, led by Senate Majority Leader Schumer on a package that is like a broad sort of China, countering China package. Um, is the White House coordinating with the Senate Democrats on this? Are you in touch with them? And is the president sort of actively going to engage with this? Effort, if with the with the proposal by Senator Schumer, correct. He, I, I'm certain if yesterday. Senator Schumer wants to discuss it with him, he's happy to discuss it with the with Senator Schumer, with Leader Schumer. But uh, I would expect the president's uh, agenda moving forward will reflect the Build Back Better agenda that he talked about on the campaign trail. But the order, the size, the timeline has not yet been determined. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. I have a couple of uh, foreign policy questions okay. specifically on Africa, but I just want to pick up something that uh, you discussed with um, earlier about the Central American Miners Program. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure that I understand you correctly, that you were presenting that as sort of like an immediate solution to what's happening at the border by saying that this will take about 3,000 kids. Well, what I don't understand is that, first of all, what's going to be processed are the kids who were uh, already in the process and it was stopped in 2017 and then State Department will uh, continue to process a new application. So that process in itself takes months, no? That they will be prioritized. Um, at, with the process was stopped as you noted in 2017 and uh, the kids who were eligible then will be prioritized. 
So it's not an immediate solution to what's happening in the board. I don't think I said that. I don't have a timeline for you, but it is what I actually, if you were listening earlier, I, I gave a number of steps, actually. That's one of the steps. The other steps and address some of the things that you just raised, including the fact that we are working to uh, find ways to accelerate the unification of children with vetted families and sponsors, embedding ORR and HHS in earlier parts of the process. Uh, we're identifying um, and assessing other licensed facilities. So this isn't a this isn't a challenge that's going to be addressed through one step, but certainly uh, the Central American Miners Program is a way, and the reason I talked about it is because it's a way to uh, help uh, ensure that the, the application process for these kids happens well, not while they're sitting in shelters in the United States or even with sponsor families, but when they are still uh, in their home countries and they will know before they make the journey that they are able to come and stay in this country. And that's a pretty pivotal step to take. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, now on the issue of Africa, mm -hmm. does the president share the assessment of Secretary Blinken that what's happening on the Western Tigray region of Ethiopia is ethnic cleansing? Does uh, the president have any specific view on the particular role of Prime Minister Abiy in this conflict? And is the U.S. considering any kind of action beyond urging the Ethiopian government to stop sending their forces? Yeah, I got a, an update on this um, from my team earlier. So let me just see what I have here to update you on. Um, uh, so the administration has repeatedly engaged uh, the U Ethiopian gov government on the importance of ending the violence, ensuring unhindered humanitarian access, and allowing a full independent international investigation into all reports of human rights abuses. As you noted, um, Secretary of State Blinken has spoken to the Ethiopian Prime Minister twice to emphasize em uh, emphasize the United States' concern about the humanitarian and human rights crisis we're seeing. Uh, during his testimony yesterday, he reiterated the situation is unacceptable and has to change, and that we're calling on the Ethiopian government to follow through on its com commitments that it's made. And also at the UN Security Council, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield has reaffirmed U.S. commitment to working bilaterally and multilaterally to help secure an end to the violence. So the President is deeply concerned, highly engaged on this issue. He recognizes that we have very active ongoing efforts by our diplomats to try to move this forward to a better place, including getting humanitarian aid workers in with full access. And of course, he remains uh, in touch and, and working closely with his Secretary of State. Uh, another topic still on the sure. continent, on the issue, still on Ethiopia, Ethiopia, actually. The Trump administration was very much engaged in mediating the conflict between Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan on the issue of the Nile Dam. Mm -hmm. Is the Biden administration willing to continue mediation process, as has been requested by Ethiopia, uh, sorry, but Sudan and Egypt? I would send you to the State Department. They'd be more directly involved at this stage. One more, one more Africa oh, question. Okay. Um, Western Sahara. Also, President uh, Trump, as you know, recognized uh, sovereignty, Morocco's sovereignty of the Western Sahara region. Now, Spain is asking for a UN resolution or UN brokered solution. Spain is a former col uh, colonizer of Western Sahara, asking for a UN brokered solution on this issue. Um, has the administration completed its review on this particular Trump deal? Because it does, you know, deal with the overall Abraham Accords policy. Mm -hmm. And what is your position on it? As you know, we are reviewing uh, all of the many Trump positions, including the Abraham Accords, but I don't have an update today for you on it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go back to the border. Um, sure. My colleagues reported yesterday that uh, the administration is uh, looking at a NASA facility in California to house some of these unaccompanied children. Can you talk a little bit about the plan to identify and find space for them? Mm -hmm. what, what sort of facilities are you looking at? I don't have a list of facilities, but I will convey that we are, or reiterate, um, that part of our effort and our focus and what we're prioritizing is identifying and assessing uh, licensed facilities that can help add safe capacity for these children. And even with the update in CDC guidelines that we've talked about a little bit this week that allows for greater capacity safely at these facilities, we still want to ensure that we have uh, facilities that are uh, safe, licensed, um, and prepared to house um, children uh, so that we can move them quickly from the Border Patrol, uh, uh, the border patrol uh, locations. Um, but I don't have anything. We're looking at a range of sites, our team is, and, and I'm sure uh, some will be hopefully identified soon, but I don't have anything to preview for you beyond that. Okay, 
Okay, and then on the trip with like, with all the principals kind of crisscrossing the country yeah. next week, it's an interesting list of states, as yeah. you said, um, purple uh, uh, at least. Um, I'm wondering, even though that this relief package has no support here, what have you been hearing, or what do you expect to hear from Republicans in these states? Do you expect to be received by them at all? Have you heard much? Like, have you Republicans like state? local elected yeah. or? Mm -hmm. Look, I think what we saw uh, even during the, the um, effort to pass the American Rescue Plan is that there were 400 governors and mayors across the country, many of them Republican. We had a Republican mayor come here and talk to you all about how vital and important this was to his community. Uh, and so we certainly anticipate that many of the local elected officials who supported the passage, um, who were seeing um, you know, funding coming into their states to help ensure that cops and firefighters keep their jobs, seeing funding that's going to come in and help reopen schools, seeing people in their communities get checks as early as this weekend, that uh, they will uh, be open, many of them, to uh, engaging with the president, the vice president, the first lady, the second gentleman, uh, where there's an opportunity to talk about the benefits and, com and communicate to their communities about how people can access these benefits. And that's a big part of the this um, blitz around the country, is ensuring that the American people have that understanding. And that's what uh, our, uh, all of our uh, principles will be conveying. Could I ask another quick one? Sure. I'm just curious. Uh, I know the president has speechwriters, but who, were you around him when he was working on this speech? Like, who were the advisors around him that have weighed in and pitched in ideas and helped him edit? Sure. Look, I, I think, um, you know, the president has been doing this a while, and certainly he had a good sense of what he wanted to convey. Uh, and he is someone who is um, a, uh, you know, a... Um, uh, an, an anti an anti acronyms advocate. Um, so he wants to uh, explain things with clarity um, and with directness uh, to the American people. And I will tell you that when he goes through speeches like this, he asks questions that I can imagine um, friends of mine and family members of mine might ask. What do you mean by that? And when you say that, how will I get access to that? And that's when he reads through the speech what he's looking to provide clarity on. And he fully recognizes that, um, that you know, speaking during a primetime address is a moment where you have to, um, you know, tell a story about uh, and, and, and recognize the, um, the, 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 the great sacrifices the American people have been through and speak with truth and with directness about what is still required um, but also um, provide some hope um, on what's ahead because uh, it, we are, as Caitlin alluded to earlier, there is still, we are still in the middle of a war with the pandemic and uh, he will certainly be clear about that, uh, but he also wants to give people a sense of what's possible and what's ahead and what we can look ahead to uh, once uh, more and more people in the country are vaccinated. Go ahead. So, so the president has visited Wisconsin and Michigan. He's going to visit Pennsylvania and Georgia. Has there been a special emphasis on him visiting presidential battleground states in the early days of his presidency? No, he did win a lot of states, so I will say that. Um, uh, he, you will see him uh, visit um, red states, states he did not win, of course, uh, blue states and states he did not visit during the campaign as well. Um, so that is certainly part of his uh, desire and interest and commitment and something we've also talked about quite a bit because he is committed to governing for all of the American people, not just people in uh, blue states or swing states or purple states or whatever color you want to call them. And uh, that is something he has a great interest in doing. And, you know, even when he was, he also visited Texas, uh, which is certainly not, not yet a blue state. But, um, but when he was there, he traveled around the state with Governor Abbott because his view is that when we're addressing crises, whether it's a weather crisis or COVID or um, the economic downturn, that, uh, you know, he's going to govern for all, for all Americans and work with people of both parties. If I could ask just an unrelated question. So the relief bill includes subsidies for the health care exchanges mm -hmm. and COVID coverage. The president during the campaign talked about also implementing a universal public option, lowering the Medicare age to 60. Does he still plan to pursue those policy initiatives, and when can we expect to hear more on that from him? Yes. I mean, we're only on day 50. We've got a lot more time to go here. Um, buckle up. Uh, yes, he is. Uh, of course, this was his 
number one priority was getting this American Rescue Plan passed. Today is a very big day here in the White House, um, significant moment for the American people, uh, of course. But he remains committed to and interested in pushing forward with uh, the rest of his agenda and the commitments he made when he ran for president uh, over the course of the last two years. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, last June, then candidate Biden said, looking ahead in the first 100 days of my presidency, I've committed to creating a National Police Oversight Commission. Is that something that he still intends to establish within the first 100 days? He does. We have 50 days left. Look at all we've accomplished in 50 days. We have much more to, much more to happen in the next 50. Is there a timeline for when he will be? I don't have a timeline for you. Uh, you know, this, of course, because when he came in, he knew that taking steps to uh, get, um, you know, addressing the pandemic under control to get relief out to the American people had to be what he spent his time doing. But of course, there's a lot he wants to do to address the four crises, as he's defined them, that are facing the country. And racial inequality is certainly one of them. Uh, he talked about, as you mentioned, the police commission uh, when he was running. And certainly, there's a lot more uh, that he would like to get done from his agenda. Can I just ask one more question about the American Rescue Plan? Yeah. Um, following up on Caitlin's question. You've said that some of the money is starting to go out as soon as this weekend. So why yeah. has the White House not yet announced the person overseeing the implementation of the bill? And when can we expect that announcement? And then once that person is appointed, how will that person be working with the various inspectors general at the agencies and the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee to ensure adequate oversight? Well, it doesn't, you know, the president believes it's a model, looking back at the Recovery Act, where having a person who can pull all the levers of, of government and uh, engage with mayors and, and you know, lead, city leaders and community leaders is an effective means of ensuring that implementation is uh, efficient um, moving forward. Um, I only told you about the per one person yesterday who is going to oversee this. So uh, while I don't have personnel announcements for you today, it's also clear that that is not delaying our implementation. I mean, the Treasury Department, the IRS, will still be the ones who are implementing the uh, direct, the direct checks or the direct deposits, which is what the majority of people will get. And of course, the Department of Education will still be the ones overseeing and working with school districts in order to get funding out to reopen schools. None of that is changing. We're just talking about a person to be the uh, coordinator, but it doesn't delay the implementation of the bill. And of course, it's a priority to him and why he wants to have somebody uh, in that position. Will that person be working with the inspectors general in the various agencies, though, to make sure that the money is going out as smoothly as possible and that there's no, I mean, I know that a lot of watchdog groups raised effort, raised yeah. issues with how the money was dispersed under agencies in the Trump administration. So will the person overseeing implementation be looking at that to make sure that Well, that reducing happen? waste, fraud, and abuse and preventing it um, is certainly a priority for the president. Uh, he's already taken steps to address that in this uh, in the last 50 days, and certainly when he was overseeing the Recovery Act, that was a priority for him. So I'm certain that as we look to implementation, that will continue to be a focus of his as well. Go ahead in the back. Yeah, a question about the uh, first meeting today of the U.S.-Israel strategic group. Mm -hmm. How important is it to President Biden that the, sort of the U.S. strategy on Iran be coordinated with Israel, given the fact that the Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, doesn't like the deal, has been very vocal about it? Mm -hmm. Uh, we feel that um, you, you noticed you noted a strategy or a meeting today, I should say, that many here may not be aware of. I can share more details on that. But um, it's vital to um, the president, to the administration, that um, as we are looking ahead to uh, a approaching diplomacy uh, and moving toward, um, you know, a, a diplomatic track to preventing Iran from acquiring a, a nuclear weapon, that Israel is a, will be a continued partner, will be regularly briefed. Uh, and that was true when uh, the JCPOA was being negotiated and put into place to begin with, and certainly would be the case if this diplomatic track moves forward. So are you trying to kind of avoid some of the public acrimony that was evidenced when Joe Biden was vice president. And it's very clear that Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't like this deal. Well, it was clear for some time. And then once it was in place, I think many countries in the region were uh, happy to have the um, a direct visibility into uh, what Iran was uh, doing uh, to have inspectors on the ground. And certainly, we're very familiar with the opposition as the bill is being negotiated. And we can, will continue to uh, work with and directly engage with Israel if, this, if there's a diplomatic path forward. And even without that, they're an important partner, Israel is. Um, 
but uh, I would say there it quieted a bit once that once once there was a recognition of um, the benefit of visibility on the ground, and we don't have that now, and we haven't had it since the Trump administration pulled out of the deal. Just just to follow up though, uh, how concerned is it uh, is President Biden of statements coming out of Israel, for example, from the head of the IDF, who uh, so the military option is still on the table, that he thinks it's a bad idea to to get back to this deal. I mean, is the United States worried that the relationship with Israel could draw the United States into some sort of armed conflict with Iran? Well, we've been clear that we feel the best path forward is a diplomatic path, and that's why we are working with our European partners to uh, see what is possible along that front. Uh, we also believe that it's an opportunity to um, expand on the JCPOA and, and work to address um, additional concerns we have in the region. Uh, but of course, we're not, we're, we're very familiar with uh, the concerns Israel has expressed, and that's one of the reasons we engage with them so closely around this and many other issues. And just very quickly, the last question. Obviously, there are imminent elections in Israel as well as Iran. Is the sort of strategy right now to kind of wait till the outcome of those elections and know who you're dealing with moving forward? No, I, I would say the strategy is to um, work in close coordination with our European partners who will continue to be key partners as part of the P5 plus one, as is Russia and China. Uh, should there be a diplomatic, and we're hopeful there's a diplomatic path forward. Uh, and certainly we are, um, you know, we view this as part of the a diplomatic process, waiting to see what the back and forth about the engagement will be, but we're not looking to delay the diplomatic process. We are, um, you know, looking to hear back from the Iranians and work closely with our Europeans on the process. Go ahead. Uh, Congressman John Yarmouth seemed to think the other day that the president's budget might not be coming until May. When, when does the president plan to release his 2022 budget blueprint and, and when he does? Will he submit a plan that, that balances in a 10-year window? Uh, I don't have any predictions for you on the timeline of the budget. As we talked about a bit during the transition, uh, because of some of the intransigence of political appointees uh, during the um, transition period, we already anticipated it would be delayed back in December and January. Obviously, the fact that we don't have a confirmed uh, OMB director in place um, doesn't help expedite that timeline, uh, but so we knew it would be delayed, but I don't have a, a specific timeline for you or a frame of what it will look like. And on, um, does the president support congressional Democrats' push to restore earmarking? Is that a way to sort of foster bipartisanship after this $1.9 trillion package that didn't get any Republican support? Well, we don't have a package yet that we're talking about, um, that we are working through with Congress. Uh, obviously, the President's uh, spent 36 years in the Senate, and he uh, is quite familiar with the role of earmarks, but uh, I don't, uh, when we have a package to announce and we're talking about the legislative strategy, we can probably talk about it more. Is that, oh, I mean, because Democrats are making the case that this will, you know, it, it's a way to get Republicans to support spending bills, things along those lines. Is that? The White House's view is, is earmarking a, a potential path to sort of break, break some of this gridlock? We just don't have a legislative package we're even talking about here. So when we do, we can have a discussion about what the legislative strategy is. But we're, we're not at that point. We just signed into law, the President just signed into law today, a $1.9 trillion package uh, that he is looking forward to implementing. That's our focus. And in the coming weeks, we'll have more to say what's next. And then we can have a discussion about how we're going to get that package through. And on the $1,400, oh, go ahead. sorry, one go more. Ahead, on, you're fine. Go ahead. On the, on the $1,400 checks, consumer advocates are, are raising concerns that private debt collectors might be able to intercept part of it because apparently language protected that in the last round of $600 checks. But because of the budget reconciliation process, um, senators had to cut that out. Would the president support standalone legislation? I think Senator Wyden says he's going to be working on that. And how, how does the president expect to get standalone legislation to take care of that issue? And how does the president expect to get bipartisan support for sort of these provisions, technical corrections like these that pop up you know, on every major bill like this? I'm not sure if there are technical corrections needed. I'd have to talk to the Department of Treasury about that. I mean, in terms of the checks, 90% uh, of them about will go via direct deposit um, to people's bank accounts that 
they have because of people paying taxes. Um, if there are other additional components that require that, I'm happy to have that discussion with them and see if they think there's technical changes needed and if those technical changes require Congress, which I, I'm, not, I'm not sure they would or wouldn't at this point. Go ahead in the back. Thank you. I have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, last week, uh, President Biden, in his virtual interaction with NASA scientist Dr. Mohan, said that uh, India, people of Indian descent are taking over the country. Can you clarify that? What did he meant by that? Because there have been some criticism by his opponents on his remarks. Well, I would first say that uh, the president was just recognizing and, and honoring and valuing, or this was his intention, uh, the incredible contribution of Indian Americans to uh, science. Uh, he was speaking to a an Indian American woman who is, a, of course, a scientist and uh, and a, an important part of the NASA team. Um, and he also was, of course, recognizing the incredible contribution of his own vice president. Uh, and he just believes that um, it was a reflection of his belief that Indian Americans uh, have a, make a great contribution to the fabric of society, whether it's science or education or the government. And uh, that was what he was trying to convey. A number of Indian Americans who came to this country as illegal immigrants and want to make this as a home. They feel that uh, the, the, this administration is not much focused on resolving the issues related to legal immigrants, rather than they are more focused on illegal immigrants. So what do you have to say on that? I would say they, we should, um, you should write an article about how uh, the president's immigration bill uh, proposes. Uh, a number of uh, fixes or changes in the legal and legislative system to ensure um, that those issues are addressed, and we're eager to move that forward with uh, members of both parties. I have one China question. Okay. Uh, today is 50th day, and tomorrow President is addressing the Quad Leaders Summit, and yeah. a few days later, uh, the Secretary of State and NSA are having their bilateral meetings in Ankara, Ankara on China. After 50 days, what are the major asks from China? What do you want China to do so that to uh, improve the relationship that the United States has with Beijing? Well, I, I would expect, obviously, this this meeting uh, next week. Uh, we felt it was important to have it on U.S. soil. We certainly anticipate that uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and Secretary of State Tony Blinken will be discussing both um, the challenges we've had um, and not holding back on uh, issues and concerns we have we have with the behavior of uh, Chinese leadership, uh, whether it's on uh, Taiwan uh, or uh, recent. Um, you know, efforts to um, push back democracy in Hong Kong uh, or on concerns we have about um, the economic uh, relationship. So they will certainly raise those issues and, and the lack of transparency as it relates to COVID, human rights abuses as well. But they'll also talk about uh, areas of uh, opportunity and ways we can work together. We uh, certainly will not, they will not be holding back in the conversation, but uh, they wanted to, you know, it's an important uh, moment next week to engage directly and, and in person. And uh, we're, uh, I know they're looking forward to it. We'll have a robust readout, I'm sure, when that meeting concludes. I have a foreign journalist colleague of mine who is going to be present here has sent me a question for you. Uh, the International Olympics Committee today announced that China will provide vaccination for athletes teams and attendees of the Tokyo Olympic Games. What is the response to, uh, what is your response to IOC's announcement? Does this, the administration recommend the U.S. athletes and attendees get vaccination from the Chinese? I, I would have to, I would send you to the, uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee. Uh, we, of course, are working to ensure that uh, the American people are, have access to vaccines, will have enough to vaccine, vaccinate, I should say, uh, all American adults by the end of May. Uh, certainly that includes Olympic athletes, uh, but I would uh, refer you to them on their plans for vaccinating athletes. Thank Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. A couple on talks we haven't touched on yet, but Politico ran a poll yesterday, I'm not sure if you saw it, finding that 53% of Americans think that there should be a ban on transgender athletes competing in women's sports. Included in that were 40% of Democratic respondents who agreed that there should be a ban, and 49% of independents. Obviously, the president is committed to advancing LGBTQ rights, but looking at this through his call for unity lens, do you think these opinions are coming more from a place of trying to protect women's rights or equality in athletics, or are these just flat out bigoted opinions that the president shouldn't acknowledge at this point in time. The opinions in the poll? Yeah. 
Well, people I, who voice support for banning transgender athletes. I did not conduct sports. the poll, nor was okay. I part of the polling committee that had conversations with people. Uh, what I can convey to you is that the president believes, regardless of this poll in Politico, did you say Politico, I guess? Politico and Morning uh, Consult, I, yeah. I didn't see the poll or the article, but uh, but I didn't read Playbook. Um, but I. Um, but I, but the president believes that transgender rights are human rights, that, uh, that kids uh, should not be discriminated against and should be able to play sports. And that continues to be his belief. Uh, and that hasn't changed. But uh, I'm not going to guess or attribute motive to the people who responded to that poll or any poll, actually. And then on the House's passage of these gun violence legislation bills uh, today, has the, has the White House been actively courting uh, Republican senators to, to, to vote yay for this? Obviously, from a number standpoint, it's going to be a lot harder to pass there than in the House. And if not, does the president believe it can pass the Senate, or those two bills can pass the Senate in their current iterations? Well, um, first, you know, the president is someone who is personally committed to addressing gun violence and uh, working to put in place uh, gun safety measures. Um, He's called on Congress to act. He supports Congress acting. Uh, he's looking forward to working with them to advance priorities, uh, including repealing gun manufacturers' liability shield. Of course, these pieces of legislation were regarding background checks, and he certainly supports uh, actions uh, by the House to pass those bills. And uh, I expect he will look for opportunities to be engaged and uh, advocate for why uh, these are not political issues. These are common sense uh, efforts to uh, keep our children safe, keep our country safe, and, um, you know, ensure that we are, um, you know, reducing gun violence in the country. And then Thanks, just, oh, oh, just one follow-up on yeah. the Quad Summit tomorrow. Does the President sure. plan on speaking with our allies about ways we can force China to stop the genocide it's committing against the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang in that summit tomorrow? Well, I know that uh, addressing uh, the genocide um, uh, against Uyghurs, M Muslims, is something that will be a topic of, of discussion with the Chinese directly next week. Uh, but certainly this conversation uh, tomorrow, and we're hoping I've invited National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan to come uh, and give you a readout of that meeting. I know there's a lot of interest in the Quad Summit tomorrow. Um, but. We expect the conversation to be about a range of global issues. Uh, it is not focused on China. Of course, China is a topic on the minds of many leaders and countries, but we expect they will talk about uh, the climate crisis, about economic cooperation, about addressing COVID, uh, a range of issues and discussions. And um, you know, certainly the position of the United States is that uh, what is happening uh, is genocide, and we um, you know, we'll look for opportunities to work with uh, other partners on uh, putting additional pressure on the Chinese, but we will also raise it directly, and it will be a topic of discussion next week. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.